I broke through the carbonate, that's how I got free. Jump I back off because there's no stopping me. Postmodern player, sample-tastic, flows ekphrastic. I get drastic, hey, watch the plastic. Yo, I name check and leave you drastic. Welcome to the MacGuffin, episode 255. I'm Spencer. I'm Greg. Today, in honor of the release of Star Trek Into Darkness. Into Dar Star Trek Into Darkness. Yeah. Star Trek Into Darkness. Um, I don't know, is that a dance? I don't know. We're going to be talking Simon Pegg. Um, I would say he's probably beloved around these parts. Oh, yeah. Very, very funny, talented guy. It's only been the fact that he hasn't done enough films that we know about to really discuss or want to discuss all yeah. of them up until this point. And if we just wanted to talk about the various British television shows he starred on, that would be a segment on its own, yeah. and most of you would have not have heard of him anyway. Yes, so. but we're going to start with one of them, Yes, a very good one of them, and one of them that plays into a lot of the future yeah, stuff. Yeah, pretty much starts a trend, or at least... Yeah, partnership solidifies a, tr uh, a partnership, part yeah. yeah, and that is spaced. Yes, spaced is the story of a man and a woman sort of forced to live together as roommates because of they're both poor. Basically, yeah, basically they fake being in a couple because yeah, being there's a, there's there's a thing in in England where you can get like basically it's like couples only housing, mm -hmm. so you have to actually be a, a couple, and all this furniture and stuff is provided, and it's cheaper, so they fake being a, in a relationship so that they can live in this nice apartment for a good price. And it uh, co-stars Jessica Hines mm -hmm. uh, as the As Daisy, roommate, the, yes. other, the other flatmate. And his friend, Nick Frost, again, you know, who comes into play very yes. much. And largely directed, or I don't know if it's entirely mm -hmm. directed by Edgar Wright. Yep. Um, who, very successful in yes. his own right, as you might imagine. Um, you know, it's... It's one of those shows that I came to after the fact. I oh, mean, definitely. It's like, I, this was definitely not the first Simon Pegg mm -mm. thing I'd become aware of. And I would say either pre or p directly after Hot Fuzz is probably when I got That's into. probably rel relatively reasonable. I mean, what, it went for two or three two seasons. Se two seasons. Um, I think it was, uh, you know, 99 to 2001. But mm -hmm. it's... It really sort of set the precursor to the style of humor that Simon Pegg would work on with Edgar Wright and Nick Frost Definitely. going forward. Very sort of quippy, very mm -hmm. clever, yes. very sort of... Um, Pay a lot of uh, paying tributes and pop culture homage and, and reference. And yes. vignettes and stuff like that. Yeah, very much so. It very So much so that Space had a, uh, like a pop culture o-meter on one of the DVDs that would come up and bring up every what every time they made a pop culture reference what it was or what it was referencing and had a little number counter in the corner and you know i i mean i'm not the biggest british mm. comedy fan I'll okay admit. you know like i think the office is okay mm -hmm. I, I mean and you're not a huge money python fan already right no not yeah. really i think yeah. The ones I liked were really strange. Like, as a kid, I really liked Mr. Bean. Okay. But I chalked that up to being a kid. Uh, he's not bad, though. No. Not bad. And uh, Faulty Towers was decent. But, you okay. know, I would just, like, I find it very, I don't know, was it dry? Okay. Very, um... Just not, it's not your thing. It's not my cup. I acknowledge okay. that it's influential. I acknowledge that it's very, um... There's something about being proper popular. and being funny. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, it's very popular. I don't dispute yes. that I'm okay. in the minority. But <laughs> I will say, in terms of space, space is a much closer to a sort of American sensibility. Like, I'm not saying agree. it's far from British style, but it's also much easier to digest from American audiences yes. because it's much more sort of slapsticky. Yeah, it's much and it's much more, like, clever and uh, maybe sarcastic than it is proper and I think dry. it's much faster paced, yeah. too. Like, that's one of the things I think that sort of troubles me a lot with British programming mm -hmm. is that it's very methodically paced, especially, like, gotcha. The Office. Yeah. Like, that is a very slow paced yes. build both spaced in it's like you know sister show but black books which mm -hmm. had dylan moran and um i forget the other lady's name oh and and um bill bailey as mm -hmm. well uh and that show was very similar for similar style very fast so like kind of characters that were already losers rather than being like characters that were somehow proper winners but uh, it's interesting that, you know, Nick Frost and Ed, and uh, Edgar Wright and Simon Pegg have worked together so many times mm. now. And this is their first collaboration, the time all three of them worked together. In fact, Edgar Wright was originally skeptical of even casting Nick Frost really? as the character of Mike. Because at the time, Frost was a waiter who didn't have any previous acting experience. Wow. Yeah. But the character of Mike was born out of the fact that he lived with Simon Pegg mm. and he made him laugh. And so the character was born out of a, him making Simon Pegg laugh. That's funny. So then they, uh, Edgar Wright later went that said that Frost was brilliant for the parts. I mean, those two have such 
phenomenal chemistry together that, I mean, I'm glad they did that. I mean, there's sort of one exception to the rule of those two, which I don't completely love. Okay. But I wouldn't say it's because those two don't work well together. I mean, they're, they're, they're so, like, they, they clearly have that friendship off screen and it clearly bleeds and Indeed. phenomenally well yes. into the show. But they really know, work well. They have a really good dynamic, the two of them. Very, very good show. It was nominated twice for BAFTA awards for situational comedy. Totally deserved. Um, totally deserved. If it, if anything else, when you find a DVD of this, it usually has a Quentin Tarantino and a Kevin Smith quote about the show on the box. It's, to give you an idea of just right, yeah. I mean <laughs> should have a Spencer quote because that speaks how good British <laughs> comedy wise it was. <laughs> Uh, Spencer actually liked it. Yeah. That'll be the quote. Yeah. But their um, partnership really yes. came to fruition just a couple years after Space mm-hmm. End, and that was Shaun of the Dead. Yes. This is the story of a man who sort of um, put in a position of breaking up right as the <laughs> world is coming to an yes. end. Um, and zo- or I guess zombie apocalypse, yes. whatever you want to call it, is yeah, occurring. They both were technically true. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, during this, you know, he try he wants to save his mom. Mm-hmm. He wants to reunite with his girlfriend mm-hmm. and uh, deal with the whole zombie situation yes. at the same time. Of course, this is also told as a comedy uh-huh. instead of the classic sort of like horror, horror zombie yes, film or drama or anything like and that. And this is probably I can't say this is the first like true comedy. Like there are definitely some you know notes of comedy and other zombie movies yes. for sure. But this is like the first flat out comedy zombie yes, movie that this is I the, saw. Yeah, that, I agree, where it was like, it was a comedy first, and then, zombie was the setting. Yes. That, As opposed to being a zombie exactly, movie. Exactly, where they tried to make yeah. it funny. Yeah. Uh, this is the first of the Triple Cornetto trilogy. Yes. The 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 three movies, that's this. Edgar Wright, yeah. Simon Pegg, and Nick Frost all yeah. together. Name, mo, uh, parodying the um, Kieslowski, sorry if I'm butchering that name. Uh, oh, three the colors. three colors, yeah, Kieslowski, yeah. 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 It's yeah. based off of the different t- colored ice creams. Shaun of the Dead has the strawberry flavored Cornetto ice cream in yes, it. Yes, it's very much red. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> You've got red on your shirt. <laughs> very, very memorable part of that movie. You know, again, you know, it's largely built on the friendship of Simon Pegg and Nick Frost. And the fan, the the momentum from Space, because most of the zombie extras in. Uh, Shaun of the Dead are fans of the TV show Spaced. They put out a casting call mm. on the Spaced fan website wow. that they wanted uh, a bunch of people to come in. So and they got all these people who love space to come in. They've developed a very much a uh, regular staple of actors who they con- mm-hmm. he continues to work with. You know, for example, Dylan Moran. Yeah. He's worked with a bunch. I believe Lucy Davis has popped up mm-hmm. a few times. You know, Kate Ashfield is a great one as well. You know, very, very funny people who they have, I mean, smartly, much like, you know, uh, Christopher Nolan and his crew. Yes. And people like that, they continue to use the same people because they know what they're going to get from mm-hmm. it. So you don't blame them for that. Yeah. In fact, the whole main cast, three main cast members from Black Books are in, uh, and f- main characters from Spaced are in uh, Shaun of the Dead. This was the first uh, of my experiences with uh, Simon Pegg. I remember this, man, this is, I mean, I've been on the internet probably like a decade at the point this was coming out, but this is sort of towards the like, tail end of my college years. Okay. And I remember there being a lot of buzz on the internet mm. about this one. I can't remember like what the first really buzzworthy internet film I sort of became aware of. Like I remember Donnie Darko being one, so I went and saw mm-hmm. that when it was originally theatrically released. Nice. This one as well. Machinist was there as well. Hmm. Um, but... You know, it's just sort of the snakes on the plane phenomenon, gotcha. but this is the f- one of the first times that I really enjoyed it. And, I, I mean, it, it was a real sort of revelation I, I feel, again. I feel like there was a, 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 a monopoly on zombie movies that George Romero had a hold on, that oh, people definitely. felt like they couldn't even attempt it yeah, without overshadowing so. it, which is interesting because they actually delayed the, film, the release of this movie based on Dawn of the Dead's mm. remake coming out because they were so similar in theme and name. But... George Romero was at, so impressed with Shaun of the Dead that he actually asked Simon Pegg and Nick Frost to 
uh, appear in Land of the Dead yes. as zombies. And they did. So, I mean, he liked it yeah. and was really impressed with it. In fact, he actually didn't get the homage to his own movie That's in funny. the movie where he says, we're coming to get you, Barbara, on the phone. Someone That's explained funny. it to him later, and he was like, oh, yeah, That's that funny. is from my movie. I mean, I, you, you talk about Dawn of the Dead, and there's sort of real estate issues with that. I mean, both of them came out in 2004, yes. and I would say both of them are in equal parts successful through the rise of the zombie Definitely. Um, world. Because that Dawn of the Dead remake was so good, Walking too. Dead. That was a very good film. Zack mm-hmm. Snyder, probably one of his best films. Mm-hmm. But, you I know... I forget that he did that. Yeah. Uh, you know, you have that as sort of like the horror version of the zombies, mm-hmm. which is obviously the sort of classical approach, though it sort of, I mean, I guess you'd say 28 Days Later yeah, as well. Yeah. Um, being another those, one. Those two were like the. <laughs> yes. But, you know, um, with that one coming out a few years before this. But, you know, those all those together really sort of reinvigorated the interest in the zombies mm-hmm. as a. A, a, a thematic a concept, element or exactly, a trope yeah. or whatever you want to call and, it. And, you know, you think about all the stuff that's come out of it, like Zombieland and whatnot. Mm-hmm. I think those are directly influenced by the path that this. Oh, definitely. For. Walking Dead being a television show, even though the comic was probably already around at this point. Yep. But I mean, still, yeah. It's 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 a great movie, and mm-hmm. you know, I mean, it wasn't it wasn't massive in terms of the like the theatrical release. Unfortunate. But, I mean, it's, I think it was like a small British movie. It was not like a fifty million dollar budget movie point. or whatever. It was a small little British, British sort of almost indie comedy coming out. And uh, after that, it developed a cult following. Oh, totally. Much... I mean, if you think about the fact, if you see a, a blonde guy in a white shirt with a red tie holding a cricket bat, it's... blood splatter or no, you know it's Simon Pegg's character. Yeah, you know. But you know, you've really reached mm-hmm. um, success. When you get into a massive franchise, and that's what he did just a few years after that with yep. Mission Impossible 3. Yes. Classic uh, Tom Cruise spy action mm-hmm. franchise. J.J. Abrams. J.J. Abrams, first time director, film directing. Film director or debut. Got the job because Tom Cruise was such a big fan of Alias. Yep. Which is a great show as well. Yep. Um, I think originally Joe... Ca- no, I, I forget the name of that. Carnahan. Yes, thank you. Who was supposed to be the director of it. Dropped out. The because he had highest, other issues that were going uh, on. Feature directorial yep. debut budget, I believe, it was like 150, 175 like that, yeah. million dollars mm-hmm. or something like that. Which, really impressive. I mean, just impressive film that it that they chose to do, chose who they did to do it, and impressive that it was successful. Not because it should have been bad, but just the giving that that's a brave move to give a first time feature film director to you know. Yeah, you I do mean, it. Just handle this third film franchise. Well, thankfully, I mean, he had out of the park. very much experience in sort of the spy action oh, totally. field already with Alias. Mm-hmm. You know, you think about um, you think about the cast, though. You have like some great people, like you have Philip Seymour Hoffman. Mm-hmm. I believe he was coming off of his win for Capote. Yes, that was that's the right. The year before, so he was coming off as like his peak, and to have him as one of the villains yes. in the movie was great. I mean, because he had only kind of been dopey roles other than Capote for a while. People, yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, you have, you had, the franchise had been doing decent. The first, the, it's been very different each episode. Of the Definitely. franchise, the first one was very much more um, a mystery. Mm-hmm. The second one was much more of an action film. Yeah. This sort of was a blend of the two. But the thing that I sort of both liked and disliked about this was Simon Pegg's part in the movie mm-hmm. because he came in directly in response. Um, to Ving Rhames. Yes. His absence in the movie. Mm-hmm. I mean, that was sort of like, I mean, well, he's, he's in the movie, yeah. but it was sort of like the his, clear the transition. Filling the role that his character had. had would ultimately yeah. take over yes. with the fourth movie. Yes. And, you know, I, I liked him. His role is very minor in comparison, mm-hmm. but it did feel like that was clearly where the direction of the film was. It's like, how are we going to have like two hackers? In exactly. The movie? So I mean, exactly. I think it's interesting that, you know, this, cause this movie was so big when it was, you, we're talking about how big the budget was for, for first time director. Uh, when, they couldn't do it. The production crew couldn't do anything about crowds watching because, you know, mm. this was really when Tom Cruise started hammering home the using real life locations mm-hmm. at, for these big, majestic yes. action scenes and going places like in the KGB and, you know, later Dubai and the fourth yes. film, stuff like that. And so they couldn't do anything about people looking at them and seeing what was happening. So, what they would do in Rome specifically, they were having a lot of problems with it. So, they actually set up a phony second unit further away, hired a bunch of girls in bikinis and old women dressed as 
nuns and pretended to be filming takes for the film while the main unit did their actual work relatively undisturbed a while. That's funny. Away. Smart. I'll give them credit for it. I mean, it's got to be hard to work with Tom Cruise. Yeah. He's very successful. However, on the flip side, they from uh, Paramount rigged uh, for a film promotion 4,500 randomly selected LA Times vending boxes with digital audio players which would play the theme song when the door wow. was opened. However, the audio players didn't stay concealed and in many cases came loose and fell on top of the stacks of newspapers in plain view and thus resulted in bomb scares. Oh, uh, wow. That's yes, uh, widely mistaken for bombs. Police bomb squads detonated a number of the vending, bo <laughs> vending boxes and even temporarily shut it down a veteran's hospital in wow. response to an apparent threat. Uh, despite these problems, however, Paramount and LA Times opted to leave the audio, bla audio players in the boxes until two days after the movie's opening. That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's. I mean, it's. I mean, sometimes when you got all that money, you don't make the best decisions. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it. It did well though. I know. That's the bottom line. I mean, it's true. It, and it's definitely. I mean, clearly, J.J. Abrams then became a producer on the series and helped sort of steward it into its position of being immensely successful. Mm -hmm. I mean, Ghost Protocol was gigantic, and yes. it just greenlit the fifth one, uh, which I think is smart. Um, I'm curious to see if they keep Simon Pegg or go back to Bing Rangs. I, I can't help but imagine they'll keep Simon Pegg because he's the bigger star at this yeah. point. As, as much as I enjoyed 3 and 4, I don't understand why any movie needs to go with this, this franchise needs to go on into 5s and 6s. I just, you know, in general, I, I have I, a problem with I'm it. That's fine all. with it when they're self-contained, like, you know, the Bond films or whatever. Yeah, like, but it, that's less numbered and more. That's not like a, you know, you change actors and things. This isn't like Fast and the Furious 6 or, you know. I think that might actually be the best of the series. That doesn't just looking for going. It looks pretty awesome. But I'm it's saying, why do you need? Can't you make a new idea? <laughs> sure, I mean you can, but as long as as long as you're not shitting on the grave of the old one, I don't mind it. Like they've they've Fair kept enough. the last few films. I mean, three and four are excellent. No, movies. I know, and that's I mean, what I'm saying. They're better I'm, than probably one and two. No, and that's what I'm saying. Is three and four have been the superior films in the series, but I still at the same perhaps, time it's sad that perhaps the question is why don't they make better films in the beginning? I don't know, Brian De Palma. I think, Why did you do make the first think, one so bad, John uh, Woo? I, I, making I, the second I, I think one the so first, horrible. I could, I could defend the first one. The second one is a little bit harder to defend, <sighs> but I don't even hate that one. You know, I, I think, I think it's a very fun film. I just, I, Simon Pegg. If three and four had never come out, I would still hate the Mission Impossible series. I mean, it's it's fun to see Simon <laughs> Pegg, though. I think this has definitely been an important role in his career, though. Definitely. This helped sort of. I mean, Shaun of the Dead, sure, there's action in it, but like, and it was the, popular in a cult following, but not popular in like an international sure. film market. Place, and I think like this really Hospital. sort of helped establish Skyman Pegg as a potential action person. Like, yes. I don't know if he's ever going to be the lead in, like, a massive franchise like Mission Impossible. Exactly. But it shows, like, you know, for things like Star Trek, which we'll talk mm -hmm. about in a while, mm -hmm. he could be a very strong player. Or his next, the next film that yes. comes up. Or which... his next film, which was Hot Fuzz. Yes. Reteaming with Edgar Wright and uh, Nick Frost. Mm -hmm. Where he lost basic two stones, so basically about 28 pounds in preparation for his role as Nick Angel, which is scary to me because because I don't think he's a big guy, so I imagine 30 pounds off of someone his size, that's like, that's, that's yeah. making him pretty lean. That's true. That's I sad. mean, funny thing is also, doesn't muscle weigh more than fat? Yes. So if he's like getting really <laughs> fit, like he, I mean, I don't know how that works. Like, he must have been even lighter. Though. Yeah, but this is the second Cornetto trilogy yes. movie. Uh, you know, a story about a cop who's uh, so <laughs> serious and uh, good mm -hmm. that he gets kicked out of his uh, city, London, he's basically, taking yeah, a small town. literally so good that he's making all the other cops look bad, so they ship basically him out. ship him out to a nowheresville to... And what looks to be just a picturesque little mm -hmm. town turns out to be uh, have a seedy underbelly of murder and uh, mm -hmm. corruption and... Has the blue Cornetto ice cream in it due to yes. them being police. Yes, exactly. <laughs> very good, very good. Uh, and, you know, it, it's, it's, it's fun as he sort of finds this friendship with a sort of bumbling cop mm -hmm. played by Nick Frost yep. who, you know, is not necessarily a great cop but has a good heart and he kind of finds his way as a cop mm -hmm. during their friendship. And, um, you know, it's the action is very remarkable. Oh, yeah. But the thing that's almost even more remarkable in it is that Simon Pegg is largely the straight man. Definitely. Like, And that's yeah. a very interesting change from a lot of their work. And I'm not saying that, like, you know, he's... 
Nick Frost or somebody was the straight man in Shaun of the Dead. That's, yeah. I mean, it was yeah, like everybody was like yeah. the Joker in that movie. Whereas yeah. this one, for the most part, he's very sort of mm-hmm. by the book throughout the entire film. Yeah, Only and it's it, mostly, he, he has this friendship with a bumbling idiot who is mostly... <laughs> and it's a very funny movie, but I would actually, I mean, I would argue it's more of an action movie it's than a, a comedy. Yeah, well, it's definitely an act, because it, in the same, it's, it's interesting because, you know, the still comedic all three of the films in, in that trilogy are basically parodies on a genre mm-hmm. so you have you know the horror genre with Shaun of the Dead and now this is like the action film genre buddy cop genre yeah, which buddy, they yeah. very much hammer home with like the bad boys mm-hmm. uh, bad boys and, and point, point break, break. yeah, yeah. It, I mean in, in, interestingly enough in preparation for writing the script for this Edgar Wright and Simon Pegg read I think that book is called Bigger. It's a Roger Ebert book mm. that ta- in- which includes all the cliches from action movies so they could include all of them, including stuff like somebody being woken up in a hotel in the middle of the night and hitting the light switch without fumbling around and like uh, a shot of the road, the middle lo- the dotted line in the middle of a mm. road as a car is driving and things like that, like all these action cliches. So they purposely watched a bunch of action movies and prepared and got all these cliches ready. In fact, Nick Frost's DVD collection is like a combination of Edgar Wright's, his brothers, and one of the producers. Wow. I mean, you got you also got to give it credit for like taking some really interesting people and using them very well, like Timothy yeah. Dalton. Oh yeah, very funny. They said they I wrote mean, that role for him and hoped he could get it, and he it, totally wanted it. It's just so weird to think about. I mean, my level of interest in Timothy Dalton by the time that came out was very, very low to say yes. the least. So it was very, yes. it was reigniting it. Plus, you get some uh, additional Jim broadband. Play- <laughs> yep, you get some additional players to the their. Um, sort of group of friends mm-hmm. that come back in the next one. Yes. You know, we got Martin Freeman mm-hmm. does a role in this, as well as, was it Petty Constantine? Yes. Who both are coming in their newest one, The World's End, yep. that's coming out this year, as mm-hmm. part of the, like, the five people yep. that are all friends in the movie. So, yes. you know, it's it's definitely an important sort of one, I guess, bonding experience as yes. all of them are in it together. But, but this but, one, yeah, I mean, had Jim Broadbent, Bill Nye was in this mm-hmm. film as yep. well. I mean, you had a pretty, and it makes sense because they had a town of, of elderly people, but they got some pretty solid actors. Yep. It was great. It was great and very, very good support. So, and you know, it, it's just great because Yarp. so full of yeah, Yarp. Yarp. So the Hound from uh, Game of Thrones. Yeah. Uh, so many, so many references and th- and jokes, and th- including the fence jumping, which was in Shaun of the Dead as well, and is in the trailer in the, for the, World's the, End. I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> they really gotta keep that for uh, all their fans. Yep. They'll recognize that if you've seen their films. Mm-hmm. But one of the more interesting projects yes. I would say Simon Pegg has decided to be into <laughs> was uh, Burke and Hare. Yes. This is the story of, was it... Um, I forget when. It was 17... 1600s? 19th century. Okay. About uh, William Burke and William Hare, um, two grave robbers yes. who stole bodies to sell them to the medical yeah. um, industry for corpse or cadavers. Yeah, there's so they could exp- competing universities who were uh, doing... You know, doing examinations and doing autopsies and teaching on bodies and needing quality bodies to show for these classes that essentially start, they start almost like a a, a race, a, a, a price war yes. on bodies. And so they get to the point where they start actually attempting to, and then killing people. Yes, because the demand to provide is so bodies. high. Yes. Because yeah, at first they're just like picking up drunks and like finding dead people kind of and thing, the thing and robbing that, graves. Yeah, the thing that we have to like really reiterate is this is a true story. Yes. Like these were real people. This yes. is a real crime. This uh-huh. occurred in England. <laughs> so if you think this is just sort of like an outlandish premise, yes. this is completely historically <laughs> accurate. And it's just, yes. it's really interesting because, yeah, this is sort of like. I think what led to sort of the interest in where bodies were coming from, because mm-hmm. at that yeah. point they did not care exactly. where it was. Because you had finally got past the point where the religious stigma was not as important as the industrial progress was, where all of a sudden looking at bodies and learning and knowing. Was... But you also didn't have sort of, sort of like overview. I mean, there was a little bit of overview in terms of like, you know, where bodies are come from. Yeah. But like, it really was not to the level it needed to be yes. such that, you know, you can make a good living. And what's it. crazy is, first off, you've got Andy Circus and. Gollum, you know, and never Yeah, and as William Hare. As William Hare, and then you've got Simon Pegg as William Burke, and this is directed by John Landis. Yep. His first mo- feature film in 13 years. Yeah, it was a long, since, it was a long uh, time. Susan's Plan, I think. Was wow, that's crazy. Time. I mean, I mean crazy. He's, he's, he was a huge during the 80s, he's kind of drifted off in the 90s, but you know, it was but great to see him come back. crazy to think that he, like, you know, is A, still alive, and B, at that point when this came out, and B, not, hadn't made any movies in all that time. 
I also I also love that you also have people like Tom Wilkinson. Oh yeah, like, that's some street cred right yeah, there. Yeah, seriously. Or uh, Tim like, Curry. That's uh -huh. a classic one. Those are play they're the two professors. Mm -hmm. They're the two evil. And it has um, Jessica. Anna Ken oh, not Anna Isla Kendrick. Fisher. Yeah, Isla Fisher. As well as Jessica Hines. Mm -hmm. Turn mm -hmm. throwback to space and mm -hmm. stuff. You know, it's I mean it's a black comedy. Yes. At its core, which it's I I enjoy. It's it's enjoyable, but it's also sort of one of those things I kind of feel bad mm. at the same time because this is true. I mean, <laughs> yeah, like yeah, yeah. it's it's you're laughing at sort of this macabre take on history yeah, yeah, and that's why i love it it's it's i mean you know I'm twisted spencer i don't know you, if you are that. you are you're very twisted and i'm a little bit twisted for liking <laughs> this but you know like something like very bad things mm -hmm. like at the end of the day those are all fictitious characters that's true. and they did fict bad things yes, to you know other wrote. fictitious people yeah. but these were real crimes <laughs> that these people were doing and it's yeah. something weird about laughing at the like murder <laughs> i know and so well, i'm still laughing <laughs> it's, it's a good movie it's definitely worth checking out i mean it's it's unfortunate i just find it funny that there would be a, the, that i just like the idea of people that are that enterprising even when they're like lowly drunks totally. who are delivering robbing graves so totally. they get to the point where they're like wait what if we cut the middleman rather than wait we'll just kill him it's, a, it's a really and interesting project for simon Pegg to take on and you know i love i do actually think andy circus is a very talented uh actor mm -hmm. in his own right not just as like Gollum, but yeah he uh he was in a film i believe it was called death of a superhero yes last year mm -hmm. he was he was great in that as the therapist for the kid in the movie right. it's a it's very talented mm -hmm. actor so i mm -hmm. i mean i like to see him it was nice to see him as him. Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm saying. Like, <laughs> and you realize when you watch him that he, that the you know so much of what we think about the characters he plays is directly taken from his face because he's a very animated. He's a very face. physical actor. Yeah, yeah. very. I mean, you know, guy. think King Kong, mm -hmm. Caesar from Planet of the Apes. All those are are him as one a, dude. Yeah, very talented dude. So it was a very very good underappreciated mm -hmm. movie. So definitely would like to hear what people think about that one. Check that yes. out. I remember, I believe it was just on video that yeah. I caught up with it or cable or something. I think it was like on that. Netflix. Yeah, it might have been. At SIF a couple years ago too, so uh, I, I, I'm gonna give him credit for that, even though I'm not positive about it. Fair so enough. We'll go with that. Moving right along, though, to one that was a bit of a misstep in my opinion, and that was Paul. Yes. This is Nick Frost and Simon Pegg mm -hmm. teaming. This time directed by Greg Matola, who I'm generally quite a big fan of. This is his follow-up to Superbad, I believe. Yeah, I, I or think Adventureland. Adventureland. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, I think Adventureland. Yeah, I think you're right. Adventureland was after Superbad, um, but you know. Very, very talented director. I enjoyed this film. It's, it's not, I know you. It's, I know you're not the hugest fan. It's of It's not bad. The problem with the, this film for me, and it's the story of two men who are on like a, British dudes who on are a, on an American, American cross country uh, tour trip, of the weird, basically tour of the weird, and they run into an mm -hmm. extraterrestrial, uh -huh. and they essentially decide to help him get back home. You know, sort of ET style. Yes. And my problem isn't so much. Simon Pegg or Nick Frost, they're funny together. Okay. They're two things. A, I think it's way too cameo heavy. Like, look, I like Jane Lynch. She's very funny. But it's sort of like every five minutes, it's sort of about like a new person making a cameo. Let's have like, you know, throw Justin Bateman a few minutes. Or let's throw <laughs> hey, uh, Jeffrey Tambor a, a few minutes. Let's throw... David Kochner a few minutes, you know, let's throw Sigourney Weaver a few minutes, let's throw Bill Hader and Joe Latrulio a few minutes. It's just like, there's too many cameras. It felt too much I about... I mean, when, when does a role occupied by a good actor switch from a cameo into just a role? When it doesn't feel like that role is unnecessary. <laughs> oh God, that's quite an argument you've got there. Like I feel like, but if they're a no-name actor, it's 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 not a cameo. It's just an unnecessary role. <laughs> yeah, okay. honestly, I'll be real. Like right. the Jane Lynch role, it's funny, but like if you cut that out of the movie, would it really have dramatically impacted the movie? Not no, really. But it's, it's not supposed to. It's a comedy. It's there to be funny. It's not. But I feel like it's not there to dramatically it, impact when, the movie. When you veer away from the <laughs> plot just for the sake of trying to come up with funny stuff, that's when you get into, like, you know, American Pie 4 or something like that. Like, you know, makes you feel well, any better that specific scene was written later because they actually had something like that happen to them, and they thought it was funny, and they wrote a scene. They put yeah. it in. You know, I, I, and number two, the bigger issue, was I didn't really like Seth Rogen as Paul. Hmm. Really didn't do it for me. I felt like it did not feel like as, like... A f cohesive feel as you know Nick Frost and uh, or Simon Pegg together. Like they're I can that maybe explain something that might give a little bit of Please reason do. why you might have felt that way, because for much of the filming, Seth Rogen was off filming Green Lantern or uh, Green, Green Hornet. Hornet. Yes, and so was unable to completely inhabit the character or uh, character Paul's motion and interact with the other actors. So instead, Joe Latrulio played Riley 
stood in and finished what he didn't complete. He studied Rogan extensively in order to impersonate his voice, performed on his knees to capture his presence, and even improvised in character as Paul. And then when filming wrapped, Rogan came back in and provided the character's voice. Yeah, I just so you don't have the same person doing it. And maybe that's where the disconnect maybe. was for you, that it was you basically had somebody overdubbing a, a, a character are animated by a different actor. I, I also just feel like there's a difference in the style of comedies of Seth Rogen versus Simon Pegg and Nick Frost. Like I feel like there's like an earnest heart to Simon hmm. Pegg and Nick Frost, whereas Seth Rogen's just like a dirty comedian. Yeah, but that's kind of who the character of Paul is. Maybe, so it, it but fits, I think it fits appropriately. I don't, I don't, character. I just, I don't, I don't, I didn't like, I didn't feel that was cohesive Kristen to me. Kristen Wiig's whole character was amazing. I thought she was film. great. Like, she's Kristen Wiig is great. Like, yeah. <laughs> but she's still at heart, though. That was the sort of thing that works like, like, for me, the thing that is sort of like, it's a comedy homage to E.T., sort of. And okay. Seth Rogen, like, just didn't feel like he had the heart. Hmm. All the other characters, you know, you think Justin, B or yeah, Jason Bateman mm -hmm. was a character who had heart. You yeah. know, all this, or Kristen Wiig's character who had heart. Blythe Danner. S Blythe Danner. Like Danner. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. She, yeah, she was a character who had heart. Mm -hmm. Like, her, her relationship with Seth Rogen's character was probably the best part of his character. Mm -hmm. But that was still only a small part of his role in the movie. It was just like... I don't know. It just it was it was not bad. Yeah. But you know, I liked it a lot. So I I I, I just if Edgar Wright had directed it, perhaps. Yeah. I maybe feel, that was... I feel that might have helped it. I'm not saying Greg Matola did a bad job, but maybe his sensibilities worked more towards Seth Rogen's Possibly. than Nick Frost and Simon Pegg. And, and you know, it makes sense that one of the first movies that they would make playing British characters in America that would be made as a movie in America, maybe that connection was a different sensibility than their timing was more successful with in a yeah. British setting with a British director. Yeah, but, I don't know. But I I, my only thing was just like, I was so looking for this movie. I love Greg Matola, mm -hmm. I love Simon Pegg and Nick Frost. And when I saw it, I was just like, oh, this is going to be like essentially the spiritual... Edgar Wright, Nick Frost on a mm. peg movie, and it just wasn't that. And I was just like, I can agree okay. it wasn't up to an Edgar Wright caliber, but again, you know, Edgar Wright isn't doing it. Those guys can do other movies and still have it be good, and I thought this one. But really, shouldn't they just all those three work together every time? Well, I, yes, I agree. <laughs> like, I, I'm all for really... Simon Pegg being Ant-Man just because I, Edgar Wright is directing it. As for, I, would, yeah, I, mean, we'll I don't even it... care if he fits the role at all in any way. Yeah. I would want it just because it would be Edgar Wright and him doing yeah. it. But I do like the, some of the, the fact that the, they paid some you know interesting credit to E.T. and Close Encounters, like there's mm -hmm. a, a movie begins in 1947 in Moorcroft, Wyoming, when Paul crashes to Earth in Close Encounters. That's where uh, Richard Dreyfuss' character mm. goes to look for questions. And the mountain where Paul signals the ship, Devil's Tower, is also the same ship used in close, a place called Close Encounters. Yeah. So they've mm -hmm. got a little neat I mean, it's, like it's, it's good. It's, a, it's, it's not bad. Like, there is definitely moments of funny. I just, it never felt like just a cohesive movie all the way through. I can agree that it's not solid. It's not consistently solid. It's one of those things that there's a lot of things I like about it, but when I step back and look at the picture instead of like, you know, like a Monet mm. where it comes out to be a clearly visible picture, uh -huh. it just looks like, I don't know, Jackson Pollock or something <laughs> where I'm like, <laughs> this is like the highest highbrow conversation we've ever had on a MacGuffin. I love that the, the options you just chose to represent a good and bad movie to you in art is a Monet well, I'm versus just, I'm just, I'm just saying, you know, you, when you think about like Monet, it's, it's was it the, the pointism? Where you step back and the dots form. Oh, bigger. I don't. I, I don't remember if that's Monet, but pointillism. I know. Yeah. What you're talking so about, you, yeah. you you know you step back. Surat and you, is okay. We'll go with them. Whatever. <laughs> but you step back and you see the big picture instead of just like a okay. series of dots. Yeah. Whereas Jackson Pollock, you step back and it's just like it's still a mash a of like of I don't know okay. what it is. So okay. That's where my maybe that was the problem. Wrong artist. So I was like, how exactly is pastels compared to Jackson? Whatever. <laughs> this shows you my art knowledge. This is why I should talk about <laughs> film. You understand me, people uh, out there. You get me. You you complete me. Uh, but fortunately, um, moving on. Yes, we can still talk about films. one that you were a big fan of. I'm a big, huge fan. of. And it was the Adventures of Tintin. Yes. This is the um, was a mocap mm -hmm. uh, Tintin uh, introduction, which mm -hmm. is going to be, I believe, three of them three. have already yep. been greenlit. The First second one, one is Peter Jackson. Yep. Which is, I believe, currently working on. Yeah, I think so. First one, Steven Spielberg, yes. based on the character Tintin, mm -hmm. um, who was it originally by Ergay? Yeah, Hair, 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 Hair,
French uh, French cartoonist from mm-hmm. way back in the day. Was yeah. it like the 20s or something? I think so, something like that. Um, story of a boy and his dog who go boy on adventure. adventures. Mm-hmm. Boy detective almost. Uh, this time the boy is voiced by Jamie, Jamie Bell. Bell. Mm-hmm. Uh, the partners in crime are Captain Haddock, Andy Serkis. Yep. Turning with that. You've got, uh, was it Skaharn? Uh, Red... Um, was his name? Whatever. Was uh, Daniel Craig? Oh, yes, yes, the bad guy. Yep, and then you had the two Thompson, Simon mm-hmm. Craig, and Nick Frost. Of course. Yep. Um, yeah, this is a lot of firsts with this film that's interesting, for Sp- Steven Spielberg, at least. Yeah. This is his first animated film, directed mm-hmm. by Steven Spielberg. It's the first comic book adaptation <laughs> that Steven Spielberg ever did. It's the first 3D movie that wow. Steven Spielberg that's ever a directed. And he's the first Oscar winning director to direct a Nickelodeon film. Peter Jackson will be the second when he nomin- wow. makes the second one. Uh, it's also the first non-Pixar movie to win the Golden Globe for Best Animated Picture since the category was introduced. Wow. I mean, that's a lot of firsts for there's one like, there's movie. A, the, the, the group of people involved with the production right off the bat, it interests me, because you had Steven yes. Spielberg, um, Peter Jackson, mm-hmm. Edgar Wright, and Joe Cornish were co-writers on this with Stephen Moffat. Yes. And you know, might not know Joe Cornish by name, but he did Attack, Attack the Block, Block, which was a phenomenal movie. Mm-hmm. And then obviously Edgar Wright. Yeah. Very familiar. And interesting, I read that basically uh, Spielberg like super bombarded Stephen Moffat with with like love and attention and said, I will protect you from everyone if you just write a script for this, and then because Spielberg's been trying to get this made since the '80s, he had an original draft in eight in like '84 at one point. And I mean, I don't know if we have to clear this up. Stephen Moff is pretty freaking talented in his own right. Yes. I mean, was it Sherlock, Doctor Who? Yes, like, he's, coupling. If you're yeah, coupling like well. he, well, I was on that Friends, the version of Friends, which then it's, we then but actually funny. But then we remade that as yes, well. So yes, yes it's, it's crazy. an American version yeah. of coupling. But uh, but no, uh, really talented guy, current showrunner on Doctor Who. In fact, that's why he there when there was rewrites needed to be done, they brought in Joe Cornish and Edgar Wright because Stephen Moffat got involved with Doctor Who and didn't have the time to work on it anymore mm. after his first draft. You know, I I mean, I'm sort of split in my feelings about this movie. Like in one regard, I very much enjoy it. Mm-hmm. Like this is sort of what I wish the fourth Indiana Jones had been. Oh, like. definitely. Like I I think that's the best critique of it mm-hmm. that I had heard is that that's what should and, be. And that's why that's why Spielberg has wanted to make Tintin because that was a crit- uh, positive criticism that Raiders was given was yeah. that it was the closest anyone's ever going to get to a Tintin movie and he felt so honored by that that he looked up Tintin and has been since trying to get a film made which is very cool the the flip side though is like yeah I understand the mocap sort of brought the actual style mm, of the mm-hmm. novels out but I also sort of would have just preferred they do a live action one in some regards I don't necessarily hate that it was mocapped but I'm just not a huge fan of mocap in general I can agree one of my problems problems with like CGI action a lot of times is the fact that it doesn't feel as fast and frantic as actual action yeah. and mocap definitely captures that much better specifically this movie the action in this film is much faster paced and sudden and chaotic than I was used to and felt more realistic for me than it did with like an animated yeah movie. but at the same time you know there, it just it still does have that flaw work where there's that was that that scene where they're chasing that thing in the car mm, mm-hmm. towards the end like that starts to feel very very sort of uh, cartoonish to me, and I, I just it's sort it's of car- based on a cartoon book. Sure, so. <laughs> but it's just it's sort of like I'm saying, you know, like as you're saying, live action just feels more dramatic. There's something okay. about it when you have to go through these action sequences in live action that feels much more uh, powerful because it's tougher to do. Whereas like in cartoons, you can theoretically do anything okay. you want, and there's no challenge. I to can it. understand saying that desire to want it to be a little bit more dark and real. In that sense, okay. and, and be live action because it's so adventurey, but it is still initially a kid's yeah. I'm, I, story I mean, where I, they I, do get in crazy zany situations I, and always live. I find I find my way understand that. I, I'm just saying, you know, do I? Am I okay with that? Yeah. Does it necessarily make it the most interesting film for me? No. Hmm. But am I necessarily what they're shooting to make with that movie? No. no. So it's sort of like, I, I appreciate where they're coming. I think it's I think it was underappreciated as a film. Yeah, well, interestingly enough, I think they, they were smart with this. They were they knew that it's the comic book is virtually unknown in the United States for mm-hmm. the most part. So this movie was first released in Europe. Uh, Which it made a hoping the favorable money. reviews would warm American audiences to the actual film upon its premiere. Even though it got $77 million box office in the USA, 
it's relatively a relatively rare example of a movie produced in the USA that was considerably more successful overseas. It made yeah. 296 million overseas. Yeah, it made almost 400 million total, which yeah. is which is pretty solid box office because it had a 130 million dollar budget, mm -hmm. which is still amazingly high. Yeah, but at the same time, yeah, like it just it just speaks to how much it was driven by foreign audiences mm -hmm. and not Americans, which is I mean. I mean, it definitely happens. I believe Battleship made a ton of money overseas too. For example, and, and it, I mean, it makes you know makes sense why like certain movies, like superhero movies, are leaning towards more catering to the and, and sci-fi movies leading, catering towards the Chinese market. Yes, getting Chinese investors and yes, putting yes elements and no into it. though. Like, I mean, if you are massively successful in America, mm -hmm. like that still usually is a huge. I agree. Feather in your cap, like well, yeah. I mean, there's like you think about like DVD revenues and stuff like that. I think that usually is much higher in America because we you tend to say that like you know most of the world lives just around China and India. If you appeal to those people, right. you don't have to do much think, to get. If you think about like <laughs> video release over there, like you're gonna make nothing on video because it's all pirated anyway. So you think about like over here, okay. a sec the secondary market is probably much higher for that kind of for stuff. for now. Yeah, until, until that becomes all pirated. Yeah. I mean, it, it already is to a certain degree, but we're still not as bad as yes. other places because it's not sort of, it's much more frowned upon here than it is over there. Sadly. So, yeah, <laughs> still, still a good film. I hope people check it out. I hope people check out the sequel. I'm definitely yeah. interested in checking out. They got so much material to work with. The first, this one was like the combination of three different stories. So Yes. But that brings us to uh, the, or this one, mm -hmm. this Friday. We're May talking 17th. Star Trek Into Darkness. I believe it was bumped up to the 16th, even, oh, nice. actually. Um, for Good regular to hear. Yes. Um, this is the sequel to J.J. Abrams' Star Trek. We yes. obviously spoke about J.J. Abrams before. Mm -hmm. Clearly a fan of Simon Pegg. Yes. Who uh, he then put in the role of Scotty. Yeah. Very good decision. One of the most uh, en uh, en engaging aspects of this was it was one of the best cast movies uh, when they rebooted the series. Uh -huh. you know, with Chris Pine as Kirk, Zachary Quinto as Spock, Zoe Saldana as Uhura. Uh, let's see, uh, it, Carl Urban Bones. You know. Yeah, it, it's crazy to think that this is yeah. Um, yeah, Anton Yesler. Uh, Anton Yelchin Yel 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 as Chekhov. Yeah. John Cho as Sulu. It's crazy to think that this is like um, essentially. Um, dang it, where was I going with that? I had it. I lost it. Oh, I don't know. Wrath of Khan? I don't know. No, no. <laughs> uh, it was, it, yeah. I, I, I like that the fact that the time travel element of the first movie. The way they mm -hmm. existed, J.J. Abrams said that that was a specific ploy to set up the reboot, so that they could essentially start new stuff and be like, okay, now we have the idea. Now that we're in an independent timeline, allows us to use ingredients from the past to come up with brand new ones to make potential stories. You know, I, I mean, I think the thing that worked for me is I'm not a Trekkie in my mm. background. Like I've watched it a few times, and never was a huge fan of it. Yes. I was always more of a Star Wars person. Same here. Um, but J.J. Abrams comes from a background of not being a Trek person mm -hmm. necessarily. And so I think, you know, him understanding what it's like not to be a Trek person helped him engage people who weren't. Yes. And I think, you know, by making it more action oriented, that sort of eased some of those um, fears that mm -hmm. non Trek people had because it usually felt like just talking heads to me most of the time. And that was what I sort of turned that. me off. And he did it with a sort of an intelligence that still kept a lot of. The original fans of the series. Eric Bana is the villain. I always forget. That. And you know, Eric Bana, I enjoyed, but one of the things I'll say going into the next one that excites me the most is that Benedict Cumberbatch mm -hmm. is the villain. And Benedict Cumberbatch has blown up like yes. a volcano the last few years. I mean, you know, Sherlock did great. Yep. And ever since then, he's been growing so. He's a uh, smog, mm -hmm. in the Hobbit, and now he's been at Cumberbatch in the same year, which is crazy mm -hmm. to think about. Two of the most signature villains, probably, of yeah, the year. John Harrison. Yes, he's going to be in together. And, you know, I mean, yeah, this one's in 3D, which, from what I've seen, has been decent. It was a compromise with the studios. He didn't want to do 3D, and this he wanted, to, and the studio didn't want him to do IMAX. So they compromised. Really? I'm they surprised they wouldn't want him to do that. Well, because they wanted him just to do to do a 3D of it. So this is actually the first shot. They compromised and did both. So it's shot in IMAX and then it's post conversion to 3D. But it's it's shocking that they wouldn't be more invested in IMAX because IMAX clearly has demonstrated that there is a market for movies released. Yeah, they just were like, nope, we want it 3D. Make it 3D. And at that time, IMAX movies weren't 3D. So this is the first time of being shot on IMAX and then being post converted into 3D. Oh, that's cool. 
Um, Shot with multiple IMAX cameras. Yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely one of my most anticipated films of the year. Yeah. I'm definitely curious to see where the series goes going forward because J.J. Abrams is obviously going to Star Wars. Yes, <laughs> and those are notoriously not... It's been said that it's not necessarily closed on the door. I believe even Simon Pegg was the one who said... Oh, you know, for doing three? Yeah. Yeah. But at the same time, it's really hard to imagine that yes. you know, He's gonna Paramount have time and work. would want to sit around and wait to see... Fox. Well, not just see if they can get Abrams back oh, yeah. and like give it another four years, yeah. five years, or whatever it's going to take before the next one would mm -hmm. be made. I find that hard to believe, but you know, Simon Pegg is so good as Scotty. Like, you know, I, the, all the actors in the movie are really mm -hmm. so good at channeling their characters and yet being themselves exactly. at the same time. Yeah, being, it doesn't being, feel forced. Yep, taking elements of the character that were that were elements and then putting them into their own acting rather than trying to act as that character and as the actor playing that yes. character. They're like, oh, these were Spock was like this, Leonard Nimoy was this way, but that's we're deal with less with that yeah. and the way Spock was and interpret that with a different actor. Yeah. So no, this is definitely one of my most anticipated films that I can't wait. Yeah, and the success of the of the first one and this one just is what makes me actually surprisingly for the first time in a long time excited about Star Wars. Yeah, I'm still not there yet. Like, I like J.J. Abrams. I wish he would do more original stuff like Super 8. Um, honestly, like, I just I feel burnt out on Star Wars at this point. And the, 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 what oh, I don't think it's necessary, and I think it's... But the, the, the things yeah. that they speak of in terms of what they're playing for the franchise, yeah. I feel like they're going to overtax it, like, instantly with, like, side projects and, you know, like, Star Wars land and blah, blah, blah. It just feels like they're going too heavy on it too quickly. But, you know what? I love Simon Pegg. That, I love but that's J. J. Disney. Abrams. They got Let's lots of money and they want to throw it out as much as possible. It's to more get like more. it's Disney and they want to make a lot of that's money because I mean. they spent all that money to that's get what it. That's I'm saying. They, they love to do the whole, we're going to spend 150% uh, to get 300 back. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, let us know what you think about Simon Pegg. Yes. And uh, join us next time for a DVD rundown of the week of May 21st. Mm -hmm. As always, you can find us at MacGuffinPodcast.com, Twitter.com slash MacGuffinCast, Facebook.com slash MacGuffinPodcast, phone number 323-761-9842. We're on iTunes, we're on Blip.tv, Miro, Roku. Check in and get glue, get some stickers, some stars and reviews on iTunes, thumbs and comments on YouTube. And uh, see you next time. Stop me. I'm on fire tonight. Magneto can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. Even Zod can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. It's tight. Don't even try to buy the size. Mr. Spock can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. The Wrath of Khan can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. The board can't stop me. I'm